All right, so I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, shall we go ahead and jump into it? All right. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us at this virtual event. My name is Margot Urban and I'd like to introduce myself as the acquisitions editor for history here at Stanford University Press. Uh, and on behalf of the press, I want to thank you all for coming. Obviously, we wish we could be meeting up in person, preferably at the seminary co-op or at the AHA. Um, but I am glad that we have the opportunity to gather together here in cyberspace. Um, just so everyone knows, we are recording this meeting. Um, and again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we're here to celebrate the publication of Susan A. Crane's new book, Nothing Happened, A History. And I will just say, you know, the first time that I came across Susan's work many years ago at this point, I found it totally surprising, delightful. And I think she really just has such a unique way of bringing a smart and historical perspective to some questions that I think are familiar to everyone, non-historians and historians alike. Um, you know, there are an endless number of puns to be made about Susan's work, which I hope she will share some of with us tonight. Um, but I'm excited for everyone to, to get to know a little bit more about this fascinating book, about what we really mean when we say that nothing happened. Uh, I'd like to thank the Seminary Co-op for co-sponsoring this event. And we would love for all of you to kill two birds with one stone and order Susan's book through them. Um, so just the order of events for tonight. Susan is going to begin with a brief overview of the book, and then we'll segue into a conversation between Susan and her interlocutor, Peter. Uh, and we'll be leaving about 15 minutes at the end for questions from the audience. So if you do have a question as we go through the, the presentation, uh, feel free to put it into the Q&A box in your Zoom screen there at the bottom. And we'll leave some time for questions from the audience at the end. So with that, I'd like to introduce our interlocutors, uh, Susan Crane, our author, and Peter Fritsche, our conversationalist. Um, so Susan A. Crane has been a professor of history at the University of Arizona since 1995. She is the author of Collecting and Historical Consciousness in Early 19th Century Germany and the editor of Museums and Memory and also the Cultural History of Memory in the 19th Century. Peter Fritsche is the W.D. and Sarah E. Trowbridge Professor of History at the University of Illinois and the author of 10 previous books, including, but not limited to, An Iron Win, Europe Under Hitler, and the award-winning Life and Death in the Third Reich. So with that, I will turn things over to Susan to start telling us more about Nothing Happened, A History. Susan, over to you. Let me start sharing uh, the screen here. I hope this is working. So I also have, uh, can't believe we're here. The book's out. Uh, and today is National Nothing Day? No, apparently it was January 16th. So thanks to some friends for sharing that. Uh, there's a, it's always Nothing Day on my planet, but for the rest of you, you can do nothing on January 16th every year. Um, first of all, I definitely have to thank the crew at the Stanford University Press uh, for getting the book out this year, this amazing, crazy, awful year. Uh, Margo and Cindy in editorial, Mimi Braverman for her careful copy editing, uh, Jessica Ling and her production team for actually getting this book to press uh, during a pandemic and everything else that was going on. Um, I know I've been holding my breath waiting for nothing to happen, right, for this book to come out, um, but they were actually getting nothing done. And so I'm grateful to all of them. Uh, I also want to thank the family and friends, my students, my colleagues who are here tonight. Um, I know we're reaching across time zones across the Americas uh, with this event, and I'm really glad that you guys are here. So thank you for having faith in nothing, and thank you, Liz, in particular, for also being an amazing copy editor. Um, I also want to say uh, thanks to the Seminary Co-op. Uh, this is a bit of a nostalgic homecoming for me. Uh, being able to co uh, cooperate <laughs> with the seminary today. Um, because when I was in grad school back in the 80s, uh, I had the best part-time job ever. I worked at 57th Street Books. That was when Jack Sella was managing the seminary co-op and Rodney and Rebecca and Franny were over there at 57th Street. And I was also laughing because, I mean, my daughter was just at the seminary co-op today. And so she sent me this photo that you're seeing 
And I was remembering that when I first arrived in Hyde Park, I kept walking up and down the street looking at this sign that said the coop. And I was like, what's the coop? And this was the old building, right? This was the downstairs. So I was like, what's the coop? And where's that great bookstore everybody's been telling me about? And I, why can't I find it? So I was a little oblivious. Anyway, uh, this is a bit nostalgic and homecoming for me. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here tonight. Uh, and thanks to the seminary co-op for co-sponsoring this. So um, maybe another segue over from uh, the seminary co-op to nothing is maybe the message or the, the outcome of <laughs> browsing the shelves is something I really miss uh, during a pandemic, not being able to go to the library, not being able to go to the bookstore, because research projects are born out of browsing the bookshelves. And it actually happened to me at the Getty. So I was at the Getty Research Institute and I was at their library and this was about mm, seven years ago. And uh, another scholar, not me, had asked for, had paged a book and it was being held for her on a shelf. And I just happened to walk by that shelf and I saw this book called Nichts ist mehr wie es war. And it was a book of photography by Eva Mann. And I started browsing through it and I thought, wow, she gets it. She gets nothing. So that's one way that this book got started. Um, there was a lot of nothing and I'm showing you a blank screen right now. I actually spend a lot of time talking about blank pages in the book and blank forms and how nothing is happening there until they get filled out. I also spend some time talking about terra nullius, empty spaces that uh, then imperial powers come to claim for themselves because they say there was nothing there, it was an empty space. I'm going to fill that space, but I'm going to fill it with historical consciousness because that's what I bring to my work. Um, I'm the kind of historian who's always been more interested in how do people remember the past than I am in just a particular place and a particular time or a particular event. I'm a historian of memory and historical consciousness. So when I started doing nothing, uh, I had to narrow it down. There was just way too much nothing out there. I couldn't do existentialism, even though I'm really interested. I couldn't do Buddhism. I couldn't do zero. I couldn't do quantum mechanics. I couldn't do physics. I just had to leave all of this nothing to the side because I, because it was too much. Nobody should try and do all of that. But for me to answer my own historical questions and to really engage my own passion for studying the past, I knew that I wanted to look at how nothing could be an expression of historical consciousness. And I came up with three kinds of historical consciousness, and they cover a lot. What was fascinating to me was the way the word nothing means such different things in each of these expressions. We can say that nothing happened, and we're, we're writing off the past as a blank and saying there was nothing worth paying attention to. Or we could say, Nothing happened, but something should have. And that's the same with nothing changed. If we say nothing has changed, we may be happy that things are the way they used to be, that we liked them that way, that a place is the way we remember it, and nothing has changed, oh, thank goodness. But it can also be a sign nothing has changed, and that's a problem, because it was bad then, it's bad now, it's still haunting the present, it's the past has never been come to terms with. So something needs to change. And then there's this middle term. Nothing is the way it was. This is a sense of disorientation of, it used to be this way, but I can't reconnect with it. There's nothing left from the past. Nothing is the way it was. Then you might either feel okay with that, thank goodness it has changed, or you might feel upset, disoriented. Nothing is the way it was. All that I have left in the present are the ruins of the past or maybe a marker, something is left over from the way things used to be to remind me that nothing is the way it was now. In every case though, what really struck me, and this, this occurred over time as I was reading, but what really struck me is that every time someone says nothing has happened, nothing has changed, they're talking about something. Every time, nothing is always something. Now, sometimes we're upset when nothing happens and sometimes we have to be glad. Here's another Chicago reference for all of you who are in Hyde Park. Um, but I did see this last spring when Emily Landon was speaking uh, to the Illinois State Legislature. And this was at the beginning of the pandemic. 
and it resonated with me because she said, if we do this right, nothing happens in the present, happens. Uh, a successful shelter in place means that you're gonna feel like it was all for nothing. There's another use of nothing, uselessness in the present. And you'd be right, but then she flips it because nothing means that nothing happened to your family. Now we should all be grateful now in January of 2021, if nothing had happened, we could all be grateful. If our families are still well, we are grateful that nothing happened. But in each case, nothing happened and that was bad leadership, bad pandemic management, or nothing happened and thank goodness my family is still safe. There's gonna be memories of both situations, of both interpretations, and they're gonna be different. So there's always going to be many kinds of memories of many kinds of nothing happening. This one, for instance, uh, I was taught in school and unfortunately my daughter was also taught it in her AP World History class. So we all know this, right? Nothing happened in the so-called dark ages, nothing happened in the middle ages. This is still a truism in some versions of what used to be called the history of Western civilization. Well, of course something happened. Of course we know that history. It's just that the Renaissance wanted to rename the Middle Ages as the Dark Ages to make themselves look better in the Renaissance. Okay, so that's one version of nothing happened. Here's another one. You can buy this sign on Amazon. Maybe you've seen it around. It's all over the world. And there's sometimes there's different years on it. But what this one tells me is that we, we have put so much energy into remembering the past and setting up historical markers to commemorate the past that we can now make a joke about it. So on this site, nothing happened. Ha ha, that's funny. It's not worth remembering, but we're putting up a plaque to not remembering. And what's happening is not remembering. Nothing is happening. It's called not remembering and it's being markered. So obviously something is happening. Um, I like this twist on it. Uh, my colleague in China history, Fabio Lanza found this one for me. The Simpsons uh, played up the historical markers and said on this site in, in 1989, nothing happened. Well, we all know what happened there in Tiananmen Square in 1989, among other things, this. So for the Chinese government to deny that anything happened in Tiananmen Square in the spring of 1989 is to revise and rewrite history in a way that we would all agree, I think is unacceptable. And yet for some people, that is how they remember. So references is to nothing happening for fun, for jokes, for revisionism, for erasure. The stakes kind of get upped pretty fast. So there's different kinds of memory of nothing happening that I pay attention to in the book. And I do keep going back and forth between the funny and the punny and the deadly serious about memory. Uh, here's another one that's one of my favorites. Again, the Simpsons are great on this. Uh, nothing happened every time so far a millennial movement has proclaimed that it would. So the world was supposed to come to an end many times before 2021. And each time, as the Simpsons say, the end is near, 50th anniversary edition, the end has been near so many times. And the one predictable thing about it is that it doesn't happen. Okay, so instead of looking at the history of millennial movements or the history of apocalypticism, I decided to look at the history of the aftermath. How do people deal with the fact that every time the world is supposed to end, it doesn't. Um, so there have been stu studies of this, social science uh, has covered it. Uh, it's, it invokes the history of religion. It also invokes the history of technology. Um, Y2K, remember that? The, the computers were all supposed to crash in the year 2000 because they weren't set up to uh, deal with that number after 190 something or 19 blank blank, 20 blank blank was gonna mess it all up. It didn't. So the predictable failure of the world to come to an end uh, is also a history of nothing happening. Um, just to bring up at least a couple more examples from Ava Mon's terrific photographs. Um, when we talk about maybe nothing has changed, some of her black and white images that were made in the 1980s were made before the fall of the Berlin Wall when she was an East German citizen living in East Germany. And yet they were published 
after the fall of the Berlin Wall in a unified Germany. So in the publication, when she says nothing is the way it was, which past is she talking about? The past before the fall of the Berlin Wall? The past that reaches back to World War II? Or is she talking about after the fall of the Berlin Wall? Nothing is the way it was. It's very ambivalent. And I liked the way that she could talk about the timelessness of a, uh, of a scene, for instance, in the town of Halle, where it seems like you can get a sense of the past. You can feel the presence of the past in these old buildings on the cobblestone street. You feel like you're in maybe another time. It could be a hundred, could be a couple hundred years ago. And yet, you know, you're in the present. I mean, there's electric lights visible in this image too. So you can have that sense of timelessness, a sense that nothing has changed. And yet in August of 1991, an awful lot has been changing with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. So how to deal with this? How do we coexist with ruins? How do we coexist with, I lived through a major historical change. I am a witness to it. I lived through it and yet nothing is the way it was. How can I have both sensibilities of loss? It's gone, there's nothing left. And at the same time, nothing is the way it was because I'm here to remember that this change has happened. So in this case, any of us who's experiencing that kind of historical consciousness, we're the ones for whom nothing is happening. Now, I realize this isn't what most people think of when they think of nothing happening. Most people think of boredom. They think of um, stuff that's not important. Uh, they think of waiting in line. Uh, they think I, nothing that I needed to pay attention to was happening. Nothing was happening. But nothing's actually happening all the time. So if we choose to write histories of it, we're just choosing different things to remember and we're calling them nothing. Here's another photo of Mons. And in this case, uh, she's photographing the, the back of a gentleman as he is walking into the university plaza area in Halle. And he's literally walking towards the ruins. So the ruins of the past are part of his everyday present. Some people think ruins are beautiful, even sublime. Some people think we need to preserve historical ruins. They're all that is left of the past. But that's never a given that we need to preserve or save any of the ruins. Sometimes ruins are rubble. Sometimes ruins are junk. They need to be removed. They're nothing worth keeping. They're nothing worth paying attention to. And I think it's unclear which ones he's walking towards here. Do you find it beautiful because the photographer has made it a beautiful image? Or do you think, oh, Somebody needs to clean that up. There's no right or wrong answer. Both things are possible because nothing is happening right now. And we get to choose which nothing we want to remember. Okay, um, I could say more uh, about other kinds of nothings that uh, are in the book, but I wanted to start off with these images in part because uh, the book is really organized around visual culture. It's really organized around popular culture, images we see, photographs, um, things that are part of our everyday lives, the mundane, the ordinary, because nothing always there. But I wanted to use photographs to draw our attention to the presence of nothing, because supposedly if there's nothing here to see, I can't show you a photograph of it. Usually when we say there's nothing here to see, you're supposed to keep moving, you're supposed to move on, you know, there's nothing to see here, keep going. Um, but I think there's always something to see and the something that I want to show people here is nothing. Okay, so visual culture as a way of expressing the presence of nothing is something I wanted to highlight with the images. Um, should I turn it over to Peter and see what kinds of uh, questions about nothing we have here? Well, let me also welcome uh, everybody on the Zoom audience and also express my appreciation to the uh, seminary. And let me also just very quickly say that this is a really brilliant book and that uh, Susan has been a uh, somebody who's really pushed the edges of uh, scholarship, but also how to write scholarship ever since her dissertation. 
at the University of Chicago. And this is, uh, uh, it's a brilliant, it's an eloquent, it's a moving, it's a funny and witty and sad uh, book. Uh, and it's also on the shorter side. Uh, it's the three main chapters. And I uh, totally uh, recommend it to you because it will keep you thinking about different things as Susan already expressed in her introduction. I myself feel somewhat um, <clears throat> able to talk about nothing because one of our favorite meals is called nothings. And uh, I, I cook them up, uh, those are scallops. And my daughter called them nothings because they need sauce in order to taste. So with that in mind um, and the children's perspective in mind, I'd like to pose my first question because I thought this was really a very interesting way in to 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 bring out your thesis to bring out the um the the, the perspective that you want readers uh to um to, to understand and that is you know the child you say okay the child something happened and <laughs> you say what happened and the child's reply is nothing nothing happened so could you just build on that? Uh, because I think that's a, it's a wonderful example of how to get into, to, to step into your book. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for the, all the kind comments. Um, so I'm smiling because I'm a mom and I'm remembering uh, a, a child who will not be named, uh, who um, had taken a crayon in her hand and walked down the hall with it. Uh, and the crayon was on the wall. Um, whether she actually at that moment, this was a long time ago, uh, said, no, 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 I didn't do it. Or whether she said, I didn't do anything. Or whether she said, nothing happened. She probably said, I didn't do it. But I think uh, parents, you guys know what I'm talking about if you're a parent. Um, children have a way of saying, uh, nothing happened and I didn't do it, right? So there's an acknowledgement that nothing happened, um, but it's acknowledged in a way that absolves someone of responsibility. So it's lovely and cute maybe, and a learning moment, right, uh, for a child and a parent, but it becomes a lot more problematic uh, when it's adults who are doing it, and adults are saying, no, nothing happened. Nobody was harmed. Uh, I didn't take that. Uh, I really did institute a bunch of policies. You just think that nothing happened. Um, so when adults start doing it, it becomes a lot less cute. But I do think it's uh, an aspect of human behavior uh, that indicates a lot of the presence of nothing. The book uh, is a very political book. And it begins with the uh, killing, I won't say murder, uh, the killing of an Italian worker in 1949. And that's where you introduce the two different kinds of nothing happened, where the regime says, well, uh, we might have expected more problems, but we didn't get them, so nothing happened. And the inhabitants of the town say there was no justice done and therefore nothing happened. And you move from the 1949 incident in Italy, but you, you also go to, to Chile. And I would like for you, nothing is a product of something. Um, the explicitly, uh, it, for you to explore is my question, the explicitly political uh, premises of your book, uh, Nothing Happened. Yeah. So a um, little bit of backstory on the two incidents that, um, two of the incidents that Peter is referencing. Um, if finding Eva Mann's book of photography on the shelves at the Getty was sort of one of the protean moments of the book. The other one was um, I was teaching a required course for history majors and the course uh, involved uh, reading about oral history. And so I asked my colleague Yadviga Pieper Muni, uh, who's an oral historian, I said, can you recommend a reading for me? And she said, you should read Alessandro Portelli's classic article the death of Luigi Trastulli. And when I read it, what I was struck by was not only is this one young man uh, killed by police who are suppressing uh, a union organized strike and protest, um, and that's tragic, this, this young man is dead. But what also struck Portelli was the way that when he interviewed people decades later, what they remembered was not only the, the death, 
but that nothing happened to the people that they believed to be the perpetrators. Police. Um, they felt justice had not happened and would persist in not happening. And that doubled the tragedy for them. So there's a tragedy of the death and then there's the tragedy that nothing happened. And the tragedy includes their own failure to demand justice. So it's even more compounded. So when nothing happened, it was nothing happened to the perpetrators and nothing happened because the people who knew what happened had failed to demand justice. So it's a combination. The other one what? I want to reference really quick is Chile, um, because uh, I'm obviously not a Chileanist, but kind of like browsing the shelves for Eva Mann, one evening there was nothing on TV and I was looking for some distraction and I was channel flipping. And I channel flipped to PBS and I came into the middle of a film by Patricio Guzman called Nostalgia for the Light. And it came into the middle of the film where he is visiting concentration camps in the Atacama Desert that lie uh, on the floor of the desert below the mountains where the uh, famous uh, astron astronomical observatories are. And I was struck by the concentration camps and the way that the prisoners in these camps are viewing the stars. They were practicing astronomy and this is one of the ways that they held it together, that they had their sanity uh, throughout their incarceration. And this is also the desert where the Pinochet regime disappeared so many of their victims. So the serendipity of browsing, the serendipity of catching a film that I might not otherwise have heard about, and then because it's me and I'm thinking about historical consciousness, seeing brings these two together as two examples where nothing is happening to the perpetrators. Guzman also interviews the women of the Atacama who are walking daily and walked it for decades, looking for the remains of their disappeared loved ones and finding nothing, mostly. And then not being able to um, be heard in court, not being able to have their losses recognized, and not being able to have the Pinochet regime held accountable until only very recently. So these are two examples where you have serendipity for me, but you also have injustice emerging as the theme. When nothing has changed, nothing happened to the perpetrators, a history of nothing is about the history of injustice. If the story is about injustice, uh, there is a sense that memory does hold certain things. Is the story of the 20th century, let's just take, you know, we have 1973 with Chile, 1949 in Italy. Is it oblivion that is the real threat or is it the possibility of remembering and holding on to memories even if you can't bring them to court? even if they are in a minor key. Mm -hmm. So we could talk about truth and reconciliation commissions. Um, we could talk about the way that the memories that the, the family members in Chile were so successful eventually at insisting upon uh, came from women who were acting out of their own personal caring about the victims and insisting that their memories be heard. Um, oblivion sounds like a kind of nothing. Oblivion sounds like it's gone, it's erased completely, uh, there's nothing left. Um, and I would suggest that calling it oblivion is a way of losing it on purpose, as opposed to the insistence on memory, the insistence on being heard and being seen is a way to resist oblivion. Right, my question was, is memory strong enough? Is, is uh, minor memory strong enough against the court, the television, and so on. And I think, of course, it's gonna be uh, uh, in a way both, and some things I guess do get forgotten. But let me switch a little bit. People read history all the time, and um, Civil War is a big genre, World War II is a big genre. What does your book, uh, how would you want your book to 
influence the way that readers read uh, these very, very popular genres? What can your book do to the readership of World War II or the Civil War? Oh my goodness. Um, I don't think I can change the way people read, but I hope people might find that they're interested in history even when they thought they weren't. Um, in other words, there's other kinds of histories that can be written. So maybe there's other kinds of histories that would be fascinating to read about the Civil War and World War II uh, from a different perspective, uh, from a perspective of memory. Gosh, those histories are out there too. Um, I guess one of my intentions in writing this book was I was thinking about people who don't care about history. Uh, and I get them in class. Uh, I have them in my family. I love these, some of these people. I know not everybody cares about history the way that I do. But I thought maybe talking about nothing is a way to get people who don't usually think about history and who don't usually spend a lot of time thinking about what is historical consciousness can maybe think about, oh, gosh, I've been thinking about history all along and I didn't know it. I, it was called nothing happened or it was called nothing is the way it was. Oh, that's a way of thinking about history. I'd like to think that the historical sort of imagination, if you will, is bigger than that. It's bigger than just the familiar ways that people might think they know this is how history is done. It's a bigger playing field and it's fun to play on. Now, William Faulkner said the past is never dead. Uh, the past uh, is still alive, Not, it's still yeah, with us yeah. around it. And in a way, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the opposite of your premise and the title. Uh, Faulkner's talking about history being drenched, uh, where he grew up and drenched in his books and drenched in his memories. And you're talking about the fallibility of memory, the, the fact that it can, can sort of melt away or can, can be made to melt away. How do you confront, how, how do you see your book in, in juxtaposition to Faulkner's famous phrase? Yeah. Oh, well, um, the past is always past and it only lives in the historian's imagination. That's Collingwood, to quote a different philosopher of history. Um, so actually, I'm thinking this is relevant, for instance, to ongoing current debates about monument removal. Let's say um, there's monuments in the United States that are being uh, defaced or graffitied and torn down right now, specifically uh, monuments to white supremacy or the memory of the Confederacy. Um, are we okay with that? Well, we get to, as a community, we always get to make choices. We can keep them. We can relabel them. We can tear them down. I don't see that as a failure of memory. Actually, I see a bigger failure of memory that was involved in allowing them to be put up to begin with, because there was a lot of erasure and suppression that went into the creation of those kinds of monuments. So I think of uh, memory as a tool uh, and it's imperfect and it includes forgetting. It includes dementia. So no, memory's never been full or complete and oblivion's never been full or complete. Um, I think of these both as ongoing processes. So uh, we can always make choices about what we want to remember and we can have better or worse arguments for keeping a monument in place. And this is always up for debate and negotiation. I, I have uh, two, 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 two more themes that I want to get to before the questions. Uh, one is a little bit in the past and the other is very directly in the present. But let me start with the past. The uh, Holocaust uh, <clears throat> appears in your, uh, you know, you discuss the Holocaust in various parts of your book. And what has always uh, astonished me is that the, the Holocaust is, as we know it, and then also teach it, really was of, of rather minimal interest uh, to contemporaries in the first 30 years after World War II. And now suddenly, uh, 25 years of the uh, Holocaust Museum in Washington, and, and probably just about that long in terms of uh, Holocaust courses in our universities. What do you make of the fact that it was there? It's there now, but it wasn't there before, even though the events themselves, the survivors, the crime, and the pain uh, was, 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 was there. Yeah. Um, so let me preface by saying, uh, as, as you know, and because uh, 
Peter actually came and uh, gave a talk in my course. Um, I've been teaching a course on the Holocaust, uh, first at the University of Oregon and now at Arizona for 27 years now. And the course is called The Holocaust in Histories and Memories. Uh, and they're plural. And so that's, that's the context in, in which I'm speaking. Um, and in the book, when I'm talking about Holocaust memory, um, one of the things that came up was a young woman who was interviewed who said, my generation knows nothing about the Holocaust. And it was the knowing nothing that obviously caught my attention. And the way that she dealt with her sense that her generation knows nothing and they need to know was she got a tattoo. And she got a tattoo, you know, on her wrist and she got the tattoo that is the same as a family member who is a survivor has. And there's a gorgeous uh, photograph of this in the book of just the, the forearms of members of the family that had gotten commemorative tattoos to help keep the memory of the victims uh, alive. The other thing that reminded me of was in the class one year and after the final exam of all things, one of my students came up to me and said, Professor Crane, I, I really want to show you something. And she rolled up the cuff of her pants and she had gotten a tattoo on her ankle of mouse. And it's the mouse figure that Art Spiegelman draws in the book, Mouse, M-A-U-S. That's become you know, famous. It's a, it's a canonical text uh, for memory of the Holocaust. But she's, she didn't have survivors in her family. She had taken the course. And as a result, she felt compelled to testify to memory. So she said, I want people to see this tattoo. And I want them to ask me, what is that? Because then I can testify. I can offer memory. I can witness because I have historical knowledge. So um, when we talk about, you know, what's the significance of nothing uh, for memory of the Holocaust, um, I think it's, it's about people making active choices uh, to say we don't want it to become part of oblivion. We don't want it, we don't want people to be able to challenge the authenticity of the history, the reality of it. We want to insist on what actually happened and not hide it behind, oh, whatever, nothing, nothing happened. So it's a form of, it becomes a form of testimony. Memory can become a form of testimony. Peter, I think I've gotten away from your question. No, I just, I mean, some of these things can't be answered. It's just, it's interesting because your examples are removed generations that are retrieving and holding on to. And yet the first generation, right at, in Israel as well as in Europe and the United States, uh, say in the period 1945 to 1965, showed uh, astonishing little interest in the Holocaust in comparison to our own um, work on the Holocaust. And that's, uh, it's, it's striking that, that, that suddenly the Holocaust has, has, has appeared as such a large um, planet in the universe. The, um, I, I, uh, one of the things I really like about your book is your sociological analysis of when things didn't happen, and you uh, refer to the um, prediction in uh, 1954, in December 54, uh, by Martin that uh, she would be rescued by aliens, and that didn't happen. And then there's these all these schools of sociological thought about and analyzing how a group uh, adapts to the fact that nothing happened, and the or phenomena of this, of course, is the absence of the second coming, which after the crucifixion was supposed to happen uh, rather in real time, uh, and it didn't, and it shaped Christianity in all sorts of ways. And I think it's a, it's a really splendid way of thinking. There's something else that didn't happen, um, and it's combined with something that did, and here I will conclude. For many people around the country, something didn't happen. Uh, and for many around the country, something did. And these are the events of January 6th, and just generally the events since uh, November 3rd, uh, 2020. And I'm wondering how you would position your book uh, in terms of, um, uh, there, there are tr the, the, well, there's two groups of true believers out there, uh, and they're, they're uh, the contact point was friction and, and violence, and how you would, uh, on the eve of uh, the uh, new presidency, uh, the last day of uh, uh, President Trump's uh, 
term in office. I remember four years ago, I was in LA with uh, Hayden White and Saul Friedlander and Judith Butler. Um, how you would position your book uh, in uh, regard to these events? Um, you were prepared for this question, so. <laughs> I know, and I'm resistant to it because um, I wrote all this before. On the other hand, I was working on the book during the last four years and I wasn't dead. You know, I, <laughs> I saw what was happening. Um, and yet, uh, I don't, this book is not going to um, stimulate activism, but maybe, maybe uh, what it could do is remind people that um, allow, allowing nothing to happen is a choice. And when, oh, let's say a failure of leadership uh, means that nothing happens in terms of, let's say, managing a pandemic, um, do we want to just leave it to the historians to write about it later about what a huge failure that was? Or do we want to acknowledge right now nothing is happening and something should be happening? So if nothing else, if it just raises awareness of the omnipresence of nothing, it's always out there, whether you like it or not, and you can choose to do something about it. And there's but something else that didn't happen, uh, and that is that... Um, what I call this muscular populism behind um, Make America Great Again, uh, that didn't happen either. Uh, if people wanted their voices heard, uh, they remained muted. If people wanted a new America, they didn't, or an old America, they didn't get it. And, uh, and that is going to be a legacy as well, I, I suspect. But we will end on an optimistic note and um, hope that uh, people who are themselves optimistic and energetic uh, will do well uh, well can for I our to community really because um, doing nothing usually sounds so useless and it sounds like a failure um, and I've been doing nothing so happily I've had I know for the last seven and, and, and this book is so full of wit I, I, I must recommend this to the audience. It is not just about, um, it, it is about uh, Susan's family, uh, Susan's daughter. It's about her own uh, incredible uh, witty mind. She said it to uh, Stanford, I'm so happy you got nothing done. Uh, this, is, this is how Susan thinks. And uh, it's, it's a splendid book and I, I think we should invite uh, the patient audience to uh, come in. And uh, I hand it over to Margo, who will then hand it over to Susan. Great. Well, thanks so much to both of you. Um, and as you've been talking, I've been remembering the other kind of wonderful details of Susan's book. So if we have enough time, I may have some questions of my own. But um, we do have a few questions from the audience. And I will start with one from Alex Pang, who asks, can you say a little bit more about how you came up with this project? For most historians, writing nothing is a bit of a nightmare. So how did nothing become a subject that you could get your arms around? Yeah, um, so actually, uh, it was a joke also earlier on in the project that I, um, I was actually doing nothing on my sabbatical, which is what the taxpayers of Arizona probably think most academics do <laughs> on their sabbaticals. You get money for nothing. But uh, there's a song, yeah. There's a whole soundtrack, actually. Should we, let's not go down there about the songs about nothing. Trust me, there's a soundtrack. Um, so uh, I spent my sabbatical doing nothing. Um, so when I would tell people, you know, I'm working on a project, I'm working on a book. Um, oh, that's great, what's it about? I'm nothing. And then they get this response of, Okay, yeah, no, that's not a conventional history. Uh, so what is it? It's unconventional history. Um, so right, I, it wasn't that I was writing nothing, um, but I was, right? So one of the things I had to do was stop thinking about the word nothing with a small n and start thinking of it as a capital N every time I meant my kind of nothing, not the one you don't pay attention to, but the one I'm, I'm absolutely paying attention to. So I was, I was literally writing nothing a lot. And I have, you know, the text to show for it. Um, there's also a couple of examples in the book of blank publications. 
of actual blank pages and I've reproduced them in the book. Thank you, Stanford, for letting me do this. An entire blank page that just shows you what it looked like uh, when it appeared in a journal, for instance, an academic journal. It was published as nothing. So yeah. yeah but Susan, what was your aha moment to come to this project? There must have been a point of inception. Yeah, no, but there were there were a couple. Um, I, I don't, you know, honestly, there wasn't one aha moment. That's the funny thing about it. Um, I think my biggest aha moment was when I realized I couldn't do all kinds of things. I had to pick. I had to go from that to, to that to make it a manageable project. Um, and when I hit on historical consciousness, I thought, finally, finally, I can write about the stuff I love and I can call it nothing. And maybe people will read it as opposed to saying, I work on the philosophy of history and I write about historical consciousness. Okay, that conversation just ended. That's like over, <laughs> unless you're also one of those few people that, you know, loves philosophy of history. There are a few of us. Thank Great. you. Um, so we have another question from Katherine Hoffman, who says, thank you for the stimulating book and discussion. And can you talk a little bit more about the distinction you make in the book between myth and fact and the ways that collective remembrances can be the former as much as the latter? especially how do power differentials fit into this distinction, especially when state actors may be pushing particular narratives to erase or disappear memory of the past? So uh, question, Catherine, um, it's absolutely. Uh, so um, who, who gets nothing, right? Because if you're, if you're someone with power who's doing it, you're denigrating it, you're pushing it aside. Um, whereas maybe somebody like me who doesn't have so much power uh, and most people don't usually care what I think, I say, hey, that's really something that's worth paying attention to and we've just called it nothing. It's a way of claiming power. So maybe it can be empowering. Um, on the difference though between um, um, myth and memory, um, you know, this gets into a whole nother big can of worms about uh, do uh, historians write stories or do they write histories? And I referenced Collingwood earlier because I love the way that this philosopher of history talked about reenactment in the historian's mind, that the, the past is what happened and history is what we write about it. And we do tell stories. They're stories based on good evidence, on facts, and an ethical practice of research. But the better the story, the more likely someone else is to read it. So we have to write good narratives, we have to write good stories. Myth is something else. Myth is active in a, in a community, myth is active in a society, it has maybe ancient roots. Uh, it's, we, we refer to it as a story and we don't hold it accountable to the same kinds of standards of, of research practice. So I, I think myths, myths are a whole nother, uh, that's, something, that's something quite different. Does that answer, I hope? Yeah, and I think, you know, part of the question too is about how, you know, this idea of pushing a particular narrative to erase or disappear the memory of the past. And I think, you know, in our past four years of uh, fake news, you know, this is something that we're all attuned to in a, in a different way. Um, yeah, putting it in, in that context. Um, I'm fascinated by erasure, um, and this is something that has, you know, its own theoretical background, but in terms of contemporary society, um, you know, we've been seeing people actively choosing to get rid of, let's say, again, a public monument. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean they're choosing erasure. That means they're choosing to rewrite the narrative. Erasure often has a lot more negative uh, intentions and connotations of wanting to get rid of the evidence. It's not the same thing. Historians are involved in rewriting. Historians are involved in rethinking and, re and changing interpretations. And we do it all the time. Otherwise, nobody would be getting any more PhDs. We'd be all done, <laughs> right? So revision is always happening, but it's not in the name of erasure. Um, so another question, this one from Joe Perry, who says, Hi, seems Joe. <laughs> it seems like nothing serves people as individuals in many ways. And I wonder how the book deals with what might be called the hyper individualist need to talk about nothing to serve constructions of the self, whether it's nostalgia or need to escape guilt or chide others or so many other uses. 
Um, and so could you speak to that kind of off the back of the, the story about the Holocaust that, that Susan was relating? Well, well, that too, and I, and I wouldn't be laughing about it if that was what I was thinking about. Joe, thank you for this. Uh, as you know, this is, this is a topic I care a lot about. Um, I, one of the, I, honestly, when I was working on the project, I thought, this is just such a weird book. This is just so weird. I wonder how historians are going to deal with it. And I've written about subjectivity and historians uh, writing about themselves uh, before. And I know there's a, um, there's a fair amount of resistance to that in the discipline still to this day. Um, and I also know that a lot of people who read histories, they're not interested in me. They don't really care what Peter is, uh, wants to say about his children or his daily life. And they don't necessarily want to hear about just what I'm thinking about, you know, just off the top of my head. They want to know about the history. That's why they read Peter's books. They want a good history that has to do with the Third Reich, right? So I'm aware that there's those resistances to the self in print. And yet I'm one of those professors who tells my students, you can use the first person. You can say, I think. You can use I and you can talk about you as long as it contributes something unique and powerful to your story. Don't just do it off the top of your head. Do it because it makes a point you can't make any other way. And so in a way, writing this whole book about nothing, this is all about me and myself. Uh, this is how I think. This is how I think about the past. I do talk in the first person. I do cite my daughter because she's brilliant. Um, I do this in print. If it makes a compelling story that helps you think about nothing in a different new way and then helps you understand the past in a new way that's profitable to you, then why not write about the self? It doesn't have to be autobiography. You don't have to diary or journal or blog, but you can use the first person and speak as an author. I know the author's dead. Okay, I know. Sorry, that's a silly joke about postmodernism and poststructuralism. Okay, but I know, and I, and I said this in print, I know the author's dead, but darn it, I wrote this. So I'm trying to recover a little bit of that narrative voice, shall we say, for myself. And I, I hope that inspires other scholars. Thanks for that. Um, so kind of on a different tack, we have a question here. If you can tell us anything about, uh, this is from Karen Anderson, how did religious zealots respond to the failures of the end times or the rapture to appear? I am thinking of the Millerites in 1844, but I'm sure there were many others. Do any contemporary Christians have an awareness of this? Uh, so what, what kinds of nothing did you find having to do with that, Susan? Thank you, Karen. Um, so this was a lot of fun to read. Um, when I got interested in the aftermath history of apoc apocalyptic movements, um, I basically got a syllabus from my colleague Richard Eaton, who had taught a course in 1999 about the end of times. So I can send you Dick's syllabus, Karen. Um, uh, a lot of it goes back to Richard Landis, actually looking at the previous millennium change in the year 1000. But in general, uh, this, uh, as Peter mentioned, there's sociologists in the 1950s who studied, and they get in trouble for how they talked about the Millerites, but basically they said, okay, we looked at how a whole bunch of apocalyptic movements ended, and we thought that in general, um, the movement would fall apart if there wasn't a sustaining group, if there wasn't a group of people who decided to hold tight, hold together, and say, we must have calculated the date wrong, or, um, uh, we weren't worthy, we weren't worthy, or uh, we were, someone did come to sort of see whether it was time for the world to end, and it was found to be a bad time, and, and that spirit or force left again, so it'll come later, it'll come later. So as long as there's a collective that holds together and holds on to that belief, uh, it will have the powerful impact on the religion, and the, and the faith will be strengthened, actually, by the failure of a prophecy. So there's a lot of uh, scholarship about that, but the one I had the most fun reading was the sociologists in the 50s uh, who were writing, um, uh, ah, why am I blanking on his name? I want to say Feininger. Um, the, oh my gosh, what's the book? It's, uh, it's, in, it's in my book. Now I'm blanking on the title. Oh, Feininger's right. Yeah, but what's the book called? It's, uh, um, it's the one in which they discuss what cognitive dissonance really Fesslinger, is. Fesslinger, Fesslinger. At Festinger. Prophecy fails when prophecy fails. Prophecy fails. Okay, Leon Festinger, when prophecy fails. So um, they're talking about um, a group that's uh, a sect uh, and they're not uh, 
part of any mainstream religion. Uh, but they think the world is about to come to the end and uh, they've been chosen to be rescued by spacemen. And they live also, guess what, in Chicago. It's another Chicago connection uh, to this group. Anyway, long story short, it, it, I discuss this a lot more uh, in, in detail in the book because it's very entertaining how this one particular group came to hold on to their faith that the world didn't come to an end on December 21 or 24 that was predicted uh, uh, because we weren't worthy. So just hang on. So when groups uh, feel secure together as a group, their faith will be stronger after the failure of the prophecy. That's what Festinger um, claims to have found. Thank you, Peter, for the reference. Um, and we have a lot of great questions here. And I think just time for one more um, to answer quickly. And it's a big question, so I'm sorry to, to rush you on this. Uh, but this one is from Ari Dubnov. Hi, Ari. Um, who says, thanks for a fascinating talk. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about the concept and phenomena called cancel culture. Um, and Ari also mentions, I cannot resist our campus at G George Washington looks like a ghost town and only policemen and National Guard stroll the streets. Let's hope nothing will happen here tomorrow. Um, so yeah, Susan, do you have anything to add about cancel culture in the, the few minutes we have left and how that might relate to, to the book? Look, I, I join, I think, everybody here in hoping that nothing happens. I mean, we've been talking about this for since the 6th, that we hope nothing else happens and that the inauguration is, is held peacefully. I don't know that I have anything brilliant to say about cancel culture, unless this is bringing up the question of erasure again. Um, um, I'm also not going to get into First Amendment freedom of speech issues. Um, I have nothing really intelligent to contribute to that debate. Sorry, Ari, I'm disappointing you on this one. Um, but I would like to say that in allowing, you know, nothing to happen in print, uh, Stanford has uh, prevented the cancellation of my hopes and dreams. <laughs> so there was a place for nothing to happen and it happened in print. And I'm just very grateful for that. And I hope that uh, people reading the book are going to have fun reading it too. Yeah, and I think one of the wonderful things about the book is that it does open up so many of these questions about, you know, what is our responsibility to the historical moment that we're living through. So I thank you, Susan, for for writing this wonderful book, um, and we'll we'll bring it to a close for today. But I just want to thank Peter for leading the conversation with Susan and for your your wonderful questions, Susan for sharing your work with us. This was wonderful. Um, thank you to, again, the Seminary Co-op for co-sponsoring this, and please uh, order the book through them. Um, and many thanks also to the Seminary Co-op just for their wonderful support of, of what university presses do. Uh, and thank you to all of you for attending this event and to Stephanie and Kendra for making it happen behind the scenes. Um, and yeah, congratulations, Susan, on the, on the publication of the book. Congratulations, Susan. And thank you. this is thank a, I'm so glad that we get to celebrate even, even if virtually, um, yeah. and we'll continue to be paying attention to all the nothing, nothing happening around us. <laughs> thank you to everybody who came today and for sticking around to uh, listen to this and to the SEM co-op and to Stanford for hosting it. Peter, thank you for your questions and thank you to the questions that came up at the end also. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and again, we had many more wonderful questions that we were not able to get to due to times, but thank you everyone for, for joining, for, for being involved. Um, and yeah, I will uh, let everyone go unless you have any, any last words, Susan or Peter. Stay care and stay safe. Yes, stay safe. Um, and hope to see everyone in person sometime before too long.